today, and I want to kind of go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to start with some prayer this morning as, as people are kind of making their way in so that we can uh, kind of... I, I'm excited about what's coming this fall because there's a lot of uh, really good conversation that's going to be happening. Hey, hey, you're on the front row. Oh, that's great. What happens when you get here? That's exactly right. You get here late and you get the front row. Um, the, we're going to be doing this week and next week is going to be a combined class like this. And we're going to be talking through uh, just some, some basic ideas. I'll tell you more about that just in, in, in a few minutes. But, but our teachers and our classes are going to be starting towards the end of September. And, uh, and so that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and I think very interesting and helpful for us because this is a good and important conversation that we need to have. So let's go ahead and open up a prayer and then I'll get right into it. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for uh, just bringing us together. I know it's a, it's a little wet Labor Day weekend and we are thankful for the rain, thankful for the opportunity to be with family and, and thank you for uh, you know giving us some opportunity to kind of uh, be off work. Uh, some of us still have to work, but I pray that you'd help us all to find rest in the, in those moments when we can. Uh, help the conversation to go well this morning, and I pray that as we kind of give an overview that you would help us to have open eyes, and um, I pray that this leads us to reading on our own and, and studying more uh, with others. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So uh, what we're going to do today is, I would love if I were to be able to give you some great things you've never heard of before, but you probably know a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but what we're going to do today is give a kind of a, an overview of Revelation uh, for our conversation that is to come, and next week we're going to continue that conversation. I'll give you a little bit more info. So I'm going to start with, some, with, with a question. Okay, so... So the question is, how much do you know about Revelation? It's in the Bible. Good job. So last book. Nice. Excellent. We're doing really good so far. There's not an S on the end. That's important. For some people, you want to pluralize it. I prefer just the one is fine. Revelation. One revelation is enough for me. It was written by John. <laughs> it was written by John. Okay. Okay. We're going we're gonna to get into some trivia questions here in a second. But it's interesting because Revelation is a conversation that has, has, I would say, shaped a lot of our culture, even pop culture. The idea of apocalypse has shaped the way we think. Uh, it shaped political decisions. It shaped alliances. It is. It has really shaped our country as a whole. But here's a couple of ways uh, in media where Revelation has kind of been pretty important. We've all seen what. What are these? Uh oh. Okay. These are the left behind books. Okay. You know how many left behind books there are? All that. All right. There's a lot of them, and he keeps pumping them out. Okay. How long is Revelation anyway? That's crazy. Okay, it's even sparked a Nicolas Cage movie, Left Behind. You know if Nicolas Cage gets involved, it's a serious issue. All right, um, the Branch Davidians, remember that in Waco? You remember the guy on the right? Do y'all remember that? Heaven's Gate, it was a, a cult in California, and they, they knew the Re Revelation apocalypse was coming, and they thought if they died, then the aliens would take them because their bodies were just a shell. And so they ended up, you know, dying, killing themselves, and they were all found in their little bunks with their nice shoes and their unitards on, and they were ready to go because they read Revelation in a particular way, as did the Branch Davidians. In fact, the Branch Davidians, that's mainly all their sermons consisted of for years and years, was interpreting the end times. So it has really shaped a lot of our conversation. So here's some trivia. Let's go ahead and get started on this. Okay, here we go. The term revelation translates the Greek word apocalypsis, which means what? Unveiling. Unveiling? Is that a consensus? Okay, good job. That's good. Good job, Brian. Okay, here's one. Example of apocalyptic writing in Hebrew uh, Bible would be the book of? Man, y'all are good at this. Okay, the author, this is easy. This is a, this is a gimme. The author claims to be writing from 
Patmos. Okay, y'all are good church Christ people. Okay, in the book of Revelation, which image represents Satan? Cow, eagle, unicorn, or dragon? Nice. Okay, this is good. Here we go. The harlot of chapter 17 and 18 symbolizes what? The Roman government, prostitution, Roman economic exploitation, or a fallen female angel who works with the devil? A, B, C, or D? A, how many? A, raise your hand. B, raise your hand. C, D. It's actually C, Roman economic exploitation. Interesting. All right, who is responsible for destroying the Jerusalem temple? Titus. These are all emperors by their people. A Titus, Domitian, Vespasian, or Nero. We're getting a little harder here. B? You say B? Anyone? Okay, Titus. When, when did that happen? Around 70 AD. Okay, here we go. Revelation 20 portrays the final place of the wicked as the lake of fire. And it's also called which of the following? Deep six, end of the line, second death of the mark of the beast. Second death, that's right. All right, I, I skipped number three. It was a little hard, so I gave it to you. One, Revelation 21, 22, the author's image of heaven is described using a bizarre symbol of a wedding between a prince and a pauper, a lamb and a holy city, a beast and a dragon, or a lion and a lamb. B, D, a lion and a lamb. Does everyone agree with that? It's interesting, isn't it? Isn't that weird? It's, it, it's a bizarre, well, to us, it's a bizarre image between a lion, a, a lamb, and a holy city. Okay, how many times does the word Antichrist appear in the Revelation? Three, seven, five, or zero? C? Did you know that Antichrist does not appear in Revelation? Interesting, isn't it? The word Antichrist is not up here. We infer it because we hear the beast. Um, Antichrist is actually in one of the Johns. I think first, second, or third John. Uh, but that's interesting. That was shocking to me. And then I went, no. And I started looking through it. Sure enough, it's not in there. But it shaped our very thinking. Okay, so the question as we begin is why would we want to study the book of Revelation? Give me an answer. Why do, why do we need to study this thing? In the Bible. Sometimes we don't, that's right. Try to, understand it. Try to understand it. And we've had conversations about this. A lot of it is it's hard to understand. And sometimes we think, is it even meant to be understood? Why else? Why, why, why study this book? It's important enough to be included. In it is important enough. Obviously, even though it's hard, it's meant to be uh, given to us too. Yeah. And, and I know whenever they were compiling that canon over centuries, it wasn't just one guy choosing a list. They, there was a vigor, uh, rigorous debate and conversation over what books to be included in the canon that we now call the Bible. And this was on the edge. It was close. Jude was one of those that was close to not being there. But, you know, God works collectively in his people to bring about amazing things. And this is the very last book of the Bible. So what is it about? I guess the question is, is it for us? Is it just a book that was written and we just kind of let it lie and maybe refer to it every once in a while? Uh, what we know is that it is a book of symbols. And a lot of symbols you have to kind of work to understand. And a lot of them we really have a hard time. And honestly, it's not just us. And we're, I would say y'all are pretty good students of Scripture. You've been raised in a particular culture and tradition that values Scripture and reading and learning. But even still, we struggle sometimes. Uh, so let's just kind of do an overview of this book really quickly. Okay, it's a book of symbols, but it's also uh, the very last book of the Bible, and it is a pastoral letter to, uh, to Christians in Asia Minor. And they were uh, confronted with a very critical religious and political situation at the time. 
Uh, John, the gospel writer, wrote in apocalyptic language. Now, one of the questions that I had in there is, why did he do this? And one of the, the prevailing theories is that he wrote in apocalyptic uh, symbols, symbology, I guess you could say, so that not everybody could understand it, but believers would understand it, but the ones who may have come across it who were you know, Gentiles, or not necessarily Gentiles, but just non-believers, they wouldn't quite get it. So a lot of times people wrote in this apocalyptic language kind of so that, so that believers would understand. And, I, and I'm still working my way through that. That's why I took it off the trivia questions, because I'm not really quite sure what that means. Uh, but it is a book of symbols. And apocalyptic means unveiling or revealing. Uh, but like the Bible in general, what does P- Peter say at the end of 1 Peter? He says, you know, Paul, or maybe Second Peter, Paul has written some things uh, that are hard to understand. So there are, the Bible isn't just simply a book that's very simple, it's cut and dry. I mean, it's, it takes some, you know, wrestling and understanding, a communal conversation. Uh, but it can and it should be understood. So the Bible's made up of 66 books. It's basically a big library of books. Uh, but the, it's the same story. And uh, it's, there's, the, the source is the same and the story is one. And so I just kind of did this. It's basically one story with five chapters, if you were to kind of break it down this way. Uh, so the first chapter is creation. God created all there is. And immediately upon the event of creation came the fall. Okay, so part two, second chapter, is the covenant. And that's what the remainder of the Old Testament tells us. Uh, God's promise is that he's going to deliver. Um, he's going to deliver, and the trouble that Israel had, which, which was a lot, fulfilling their roles as the agents of God. But God's promises are that His holiness is going to be revealed in the next chapter, chapter 3, which is through Christ. You know, God came in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, to accomplish reconciliation uh, of humankind and our Creator. So the fourth chapter, if the third chapter was was uh, Jesus Christ. What's the fourth chapter? Okay, close. In between that. There you go. Good, good. But that is true because coming back is, is this fifth one. Okay, so we have this idea of, of the church. You know, Acts through Jude tells us of the story of the church. You know, the people of God bear witness to the salvation that God has brought through Jesus. And finally, we have this this coming back, this consummation, this, this conclusion. Now, we may know the end of the matter in terms that we can grasp, right? So, so while God has uh, provided the book of Revelation as a conclusion to history, we need to remember as we read it and, and, and hear it, John wrote it to a specific people in a specific place and time for a specific purpose. Okay, it was a letter to a people that he knew and he, he felt a pastoral responsibility to these people. The letter was written with this intent that it would be publicly proclaimed, read aloud in one sitting. Can you imagine, that, what if that was this class? Hey, we're going to read Revelation all the way through. We probably have some people kind of slowly get up and leave in, in a little bit. But it, what it was meant to, this was meant to be read out loud in front of everybody and heard. Uh, look at 1-3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, in my sermon today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this idea of the end is near and what that meant, because they said it with such conviction. But we know it wasn't near there. I mean, we're still around. I'll, you have to pay attention. You have to come to the sermon and hear it. Um, but this is an idea that, that is best perceived through listening, uh, through imagination. And it's important to remember that as a letter written on a specific occasion, uh, it's, it was written for us. And you've hear, heard us say this a lot. It's written for us, but not necessarily to us. Because to understand the message of God for us, we must be aware of the particulars of the situations that prompted John to write this particular letter. So the, the audience was first century Christians in Asia Minor. They were in crisis. Uh, it's the place we know of as Turkey. 
Um, he wrote to specific churches in specific cities. And by the way, in October and November, I'm going to be having a series on the seven letters to the seven churches. And granted, each of those letters, they're, they're not very big, but I think what what you find is that these letters kind of encapsulate how, as believers, we are to, to really embrace the love and message of Christ during difficult, difficult situations, and specifically how it kind of relates to the revelation uh, in total. Um, the earliest tradition places it writing at the end of Domitian in 95 or 96. Uh, set in 79, uh, Pompeii happened. Remember Pompeii? Some of you probably don't. It was... Um, a thing that happened. Um, Christians were outsiders at that time. Persona non grata. They were considered unpatriotic. They were considered atheistic. And the dangerous climate politically and I would say physically and socially forced them to ask the question because this has been a few decades past the resurrection. They were forced to ask the question, who are we? And what really is our place in this culture? A culture that they loved. They, they loved their country. They felt safe eh, for the most part. But now they were suddenly starting to feel oppressed, tension, pushed out the land that they, that they called home. And so there was this relationship between Christians and Jews at the time. And, and so whenever you start kind of reading this book, some of it at first blush looks a little anti-Semitic. But we need to realize that most of the Christians, a lot of the Christians at that time were, were Jewish. Okay, They didn't just stop being Jews when they became a Christian. They were Jewish believers. And, and so um, the, the problem is still the fact that anybody who rejects Jesus Christ you know, regardless of their ethnic origin or anything like that, Anyone who was rejecting Jesus or is without a Savior, they're lost. And that's the way it was back then. Even though you were Jewish, if you did not believe in Jesus, then, then they considered those who didn't believe lost, just like, like we do even today. Uh, but the Jews, after this big uprising that they had, they had reached an agreement with Rome. And it, it was all okay. It was, a t it was a little delicate balance of a relationship. And for the Jews and um, the Romans, it was, a, it, was, it was a good relationship. But they wanted to make sure that the Romans knew those Christians, though, they're not one of us. So even though they're Jewish, none of this really pertains to them because they're not really our kind of Jewish people. Okay, the Jews were happy to see the Christian communities destroyed by Rome. Heresy was dealt with very severely. And so the question is, and I think this is becoming a question for us even today in our difficult climate, is that you know, um, the people of God is not this abstract problem. It's not just something you think about. Who are the people of God? This is genuine at this, at this time in, in Revelation. It's genuine and it's life-threatening who the people of God really are. So the relationship between the Romans and the Jews are interesting because uh, Domitian had just declared, uh, decreed this, um, this law that anytime you did anything in uh, civil, uh, I would say, whether it's um, anything that had to do with taxes or anything official, you had to begin with this. Our Lord and God Domitian. So that was, that was something you had to proclaim. And a lot of times it was just, you just burn a little incense, and, but you had to say this, our Lord and God, Domitian. So if you were a Christian and you were going in to sell at the market, because that's how you made your living, there's always a guy at the very front of the marketplace and they would say, okay, um, you get booth number three, just uh, light the incense, say the words, and you can go and sell. And now you're faced with a difficult decision. Do I say it? Because if I don't, I can't get in. I can't sell. Now I'm forced to be on the outside with all these, you know, wackos. Now all of a sudden you're financially hurt. And now people are going, why didn't he say it? Oh, he must not be patriotic. He must not love our country. 
So this is a serious issue going on, and Christians have a really hard time. Some people said, ah, I can say it. It's okay. I don't really mean it. I'm just, it's just a means to an end. And there were some people who were like, no, I can't, because Domitian is not my Lord and God. So here's an interesting letter uh, from Pliny. Um, he's the uh, governor of Bithynia around 110, and he's talking to uh, Emperor Trahan. So I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts. This is a, a, a whole set of exchanges of letters between these two people uh, on a variety of administrative and political matters. And so he encounters Christianity for the first time, and he writes to the emperor about this. And so he says, Pliny says, It is my practice, my lord, to refer you to all matters concerning which I am in doubt. For who can better give guidance to my hesitation or inform my ignorance? I've never participated in the trials of Christians. I therefore do not know what offenses it is the practice to punish or investigate and to what extent. And I've not been a little hesitant as to whether there should be any distinct or account on account, a distinction on account of age, or no difference between the very young and the more mature. Should pardon be granted for repentance? Or if a man has once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one, whether the name itself, even without offenses, or only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. I don't know. Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these two as to whether they were Christians. Those who, conf- those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment. Who I persisted, uh, uh, those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, their stubbornness and inflexibility, their obstinacy surely deserves to be punished. And there were others possessed of the same folly. But because they were Roman citizens, I signed an order for them to be transferred to Rome. So accusation spread, as usually happens, and several incidents occurred. An anonymous document was published containing the names of many persons, those who denied they were or had been Christians when they invoked the gods and words dictated by me, offered prayer with incense and wine to your image, which I had ordered to be brought for this purpose together with the statues of the gods and moreover curse Christ, none of which those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do. He says others named by the informer declared that they were Christians but then denied it, asserting they had been but ceased to be now some three years before. Others, many years, some as much as 25 years, they all worshipped your image and the statues of God and the cursed Christ. This is what's interesting. They were, um, hang on, I'm going to go down. Um, He says, he says, okay, they asserted, however, the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, not to, but not to commit fraud or theft or adultery, to not falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When it was over, it was their custom to depart and assemble again to partake of food, but innocent food, ordinary food. Even this they affirmed they had ceased to do after my edict, by which in accordance with your instructions, I had forbidden political association. This is interesting. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. For many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes are and will be endangered For the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and the farms. It seems possible to check and to cure it. It's certainly quite clear that the temples, which had almost been deserted, have begun to be frequented, that the established religious rites, not long neglected, are being resumed. Sacrificial animals are coming. Hence, it's easy to imagine what a multitude of people can be reformed if an opportunity for repentance is afforded just interesting to hear that that you know as i'm reading this i'm thinking what would what would i say if they brought me in with a threat of punishment pain or execution are you a christian and we know the movies we've seen the stories there's a lot of serious ness when it comes to the culture that was being written to they were being faced with some serious serious problems. There was treason, ingratitude towards Rome. 
So one of the questions they're asking is, who are we in this culture now? You know, where does our allegiance lie? So if you think about it, um, let's say that something like that started happening here. What are our options? Do we quit Christ? Do we lie? You know, with our conscience, we say, I'll do that, but I'm still going to be working for Christ. And it's okay if I say our Lord and God to me, I don't really mean it. Do we fight? Take up arms? In fact, if you look at um, an apocryphal book called the Maccabees, there are two different types of end times here. Uh, Revelation is written by John, and it's about this nonviolent protest against the government who is forcing you into, you know, denying Christ. And Maccabees is talking about uh, violent protest against the government who's forcing you to deny God. And you can read Maccabees on your own, but it's, it's interesting. One was successful, but had a short run, maybe a hundred years of independence. But the Revelation promises to be successful for eternity. What do we do? Do we fight? Do we try to change the law? Do we blend in? Do we die? These are the questions that Revelation forces us to ask. And it's also prophetic. It doesn't mean it pre predicts the future, but it basically talks about the unfolding of the end of history. You know, John's audience would not have understood this if it were written to a time that was way in the future. It was written to them about events unfolding during their time. I love this Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come. He's the Almighty. There's this sense that, that God is the beginning. He is the end. He's coming. That's a prophetic statement that hopefully gives us hope, especially those of us who believe and who are enduring difficult suffering. So that's what, I, that's what I want to do for the next 15 minutes, 10 minutes. I just want to outline this book really quickly, just so that as you begin to read, you'll understand that it's, it's laid out pretty well. It's in a, a couple of different sections. So let's go ahead and kind of go through this. Um, we have this letter opening, 1, 1 through 8. Let's read Revelation 1, and let's go ahead and read 1 through 8. I may have 1 through 3 on here. I don't. Let's go ahead and read it. This is what it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's pretty powerful right there. You know, if you hear that, something good's coming, something deep. So pay attention, because this is a revelation of Jesus Christ to his people. So we have um, the second one is basically God speaking to the churches in the cities. Uh, it's 1-9 through 3-22. So these are actual cities in Asia Minor in AD 95. Um, there are seven churches. There are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay, each of those have their own significant issues. Some of them are praised, but most all of them have something that God expects from them, a little bit more from them. 
uh, chapter 3, or the third section, God judges the great city. It's 4.1 through 18.24. So this is whenever you really get into a lot of uh, this kind of deep symbology, uh, symbolism that is a little bit hard to understand. Um, God, Christ, is going to judge the principalities, going to judge the powers. Uh, where is this all located? What is the big city that they always name? Rome, Rome okay. And, and so um, the specific city that they name in, in is what? Babylon. Yeah, Babylon is the, is the city. And so a lot of times people are like, well, how literate can it be? It's, it's Babylon, and Babylon fell years before this. And that culture, Babylon, was the ipso facto representation of anything that would take the people of God or try to, to, to capture or remove the people of God from God himself. Because, you know, people of God were taken, they were held captive. And so Babylon has basically become the image of the evil city. And what's interesting is Babylon is usually the country in the world that has the most dominance, the most power. Um, people have referred to America as the new Babylon. And I think in a lot of ways that's probably true. When we realize the culture we're in, if we really were to, to live exactly like Jesus, it would be really, it would get hard. Because the world does not necessarily appreciate that kind of generosity or love or compassion. But Babylon is the rebellious world, and it's seen in this uh, transcendent perspective. Babylon destroyed the temple in 586. Uh, Rome is now the new Babylon in this Revelation book. Uh, it's the political and economic power that seeks to be you know, over and con in control of everything. Uh, so you see some images in this little section. Uh, you see seals, trumpets, and bowls of wrath. And basically, if you read these, those, the seals, the bowls, and the trumpets tell kind of the same story three different ways. The same uh, kind of story. The, the message of God is contained in these for the world. The seals are a message for the church. You know, trouble comes, but don't fear. Be faithful in the face of trouble. The trumpets are a message to the reachable, those people who are open, who have a willingness to hear, those who are willing to hear a warning. Um, he says, you know, life is fragile. Don't miss out on this message, what God is offering to you. The bowls of wrath are the very same events, but being described, that's described in the seals and the trumpets. Only those who are killed by the troubles and are not a part of God's kingdom are going to be subject to to wrath. So three simultaneous perspectives on history from Jesus to the very end. So opening seven seals, uh, seven trumpets, there's going to be this, they're going to expose the powers of evil, then we have the seven bowls of wrath, and then in 17, 1 through 18, 24, we have the fall of Babylon. And if you read it, it's really kind of sad because when Babylon falls, it says the merchants stand by the waters and weep. Because who profits from, from Babylon? Merchants, it's about making money. It's about, and now their cash cow's gone. That's really what a lot of the world values most of all. And then finally, God's redeeming the holy city, 19.1 through 22.20. 20. Uh, we have these seven scenes of God's ultimate victory. We have the return of Christ, the last battle, the binding of Satan. We have this thousand-year reign, uh, the, the defeat of Gog and Magog, the last judgment, and then New Jerusalem. And then finally, the vision ends in 22 verses 6 through 20. And then we have this um, letter closing in 22, 20, being through 21. Um, I think I have this up here. This is what it says. That's one through three. Let's see. Oh, I have all this again. Hang on. Okay. So he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. All right. So what we're going to talk about more next week, I'm going to get into a little bit today, but next week we're going to be talking through uh, some of the approaches that we have collectively taken when we read Revelation. We're going to be going over numbers 
that we encounter quite often. And we're going to be having some, some, uh, a lot of time for Q&A. But, but when we go back to this little section of 19 through 20, all these little scenes, the return of Christ, the last battle, uh, the binding of Satan, the thousand-year reign, we have our ideas of what those are supposed to be. So tell me, what do you know? Let's just go ahead and go to the Battle of Armageddon. What do you know about the Battle of Armageddon? And in your mind, what, what happens there? Mass destruction. Okay, mass destruction. Okay. God wins. God wins. Nice. Do it. Armies of angels fighting. Okay. His people win. Okay. Okay. Nice. All right. I'm just going to add, and honestly, none of these may necessarily be right or wrong. I'm just, I'm just curious to see where you are because we all have our imagination about what this looks like. So for a second, let's move on to the binding of Satan. What is that, what is that all about? In your head, what, is that, what does that mean? The man of the end. The end. Satan's done. He's done. No more. Evil is no more. No more. Okay. What else? Anything? Any? Anybody else have anything different? Well, it for a thousand years. Okay. It lasts for and it's, it lasts for a thousand years, right? Because if you read it, it's only a thousand years that he's bound. Yeah. There's there's a lot of detail. There's a new heaven. Okay, a new heaven and a new earth. And there's a lot of conversation about that too. What is a new heaven and a new earth? Is it a, it's a whole new celestial project that's being undertaken right now? You know, the construction's gone going. Is it, is it something that happens here? Is the new earth here? Or is it a whole new planet? Depending on what you know, particular faith you follow, you could have your own planet at some point. Right? Okay, what, so, okay, let's look at um, the last judgment. What do you think of in the last judgment? 2011 through 15. Let's, let's turn there real quick. Chapter 20, 11 through 15. Someone read 11 through 15 for me, please. Could you do that? Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done and recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I can't tell you how many times I heard that growing up. In my fundamental background, little nice church. What does that mean to you? When you hear that, what does it, what does it do to you? Does it give you comfort? A little anxiety? Not comfort. Not comfort, okay. Why not? Would you say something? A little scary. A little scary, all right. Okay, bad, right. No room for compromise. No room for compromise. I think it's also kind of contradictory to everything that I read about Jesus, who is you know, loving and caring, second chances, and this is just like, nope, name's not in the book, done. Like, you know, yeah. There's some tension there, isn't there? I grew up on a, on a, um, a steady diet of, of chick tracks. You ever heard of those chick tracks? Uh, good. All right. Um, but they're little, they're little comic books, little, you know, uh, comic books that are, you know, every, 
every horrible way you could die without Christ, right? Um, but one of them was about the great white throne judgment. And I remember it, and it just seared into my brain. It's this huge figure on a throne doing one of the Captain Kirk leans, you know, he just leaning like that, and he's faceless, and there's all these people around in terror. And granted, I know that, I know that, I mean, every, there's a reason why the angels always say, don't be afraid, because <laughs> whatever that world is like is probably a little terrifying to us. Um, all filled. But I just remember being so scared. So how do you balance the fear and the excitement? I mean, can we be excited about the great white throne judgment according to Revelation? You, you, you could be, because you know my name's in there. But at the same time, you're balancing what, what does that mean for those who aren't? But we all have our ideas of what that means. Yes, sir? And one of the things that makes it scary is he continually talks about they were judged based upon what they had done. Right. And so that's where we get this idea of earning our salvation. When we know we can't do it, it's all done at the cross. And so that, I think, goes with what Cody was saying. It's confusing because we're told over and over our salvation was earned at the cross, and we can't earn it, and yet he's opening the book based on what we have done. That's confusing. I think it's also what we had not done. Based on these, could be either way, what we have done or not. Because what we don't do is sometimes just as difficult or um, exposing as what we do. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's hard too because there was a very Jewish notion that, that what you did really mattered. And I think that's still the case, by the way. I think what we do does matter. In fact, uh, whenever you look at the, when this was written, this is one of the very last books. So, so Paul had been circulating. Matthew's been circulating. John, Luke, Peter, those those books have been kind of made, finding their way through little the hands of, of certain little churches, and the conversation has started. Some people even say that Matthew was written in some ways as a direct, um, not contradiction, but kind of another argument to Paul, who some people were saying, faith only, and Matthew's like, hang on, what you do matters. So that was a very Jewish notion about what you did. So whenever it comes to that little moment at the end, when it says you'll be judged by your deeds, that's a little scary too, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. But right. That's right, because the book of life is a, I mean, that's, that, that's a key piece of literature there. That's sitting there in heaven, being filled in. So there's a lot of things that we, I don't know, a lot of people have misinterpreted. But granted, we all do our best. You know, uh, some people will take it and they'll use it. And I feel like a lot of people that I knew when I was early in life used it as a manipulation tool, spiritually manipulating me. Uh, and and I've, I've seen that. But I also know some people who never, never touch Revelation because they don't, they don't understand it. Some, some they don't agree with it. They just don't even mess with it. And I don't think that that's right either. So hopefully over the next several weeks, we'll be able to at least dig in a little deeper. Uh, we're not going to claim to have all the answers, but I hope that we can ask some good questions that will point us to continue to read. And hopefully the Spirit, through our group conversation, will allow some further revelation to occur so that we don't have to be terrified or afraid. We can have a healthy balance knowing whose we are and knowing our job, which is to be the light of Christ to the world. And hopefully it'll instill some sort of mission in us even further to know that there are people who desperately need to know him. 
So what we'll do next week, we're going to talk about numbers. We're going to talk about uh, these idea of premillennialism, amillennialism, all the other millennialisms, and then we're going to have some Q&A. Uh, so get some questions ready. And I'm sorry, I kind of feel like I did a data dump on all of you today, but I think we kind of needed to have a good foundation as we kind of begin this. So if anybody wants to have this outline, uh, let me know and I can just make it available to you so that you can uh, use it for further study. Um, any last questions before we dismiss? Yes. Now, if anyone is interested in teaching adult Bible class, to talk to one of us because we're still looking for teachers. Great. Okay. So um, one of the ongoing issues that we have is is trying to find adult Bible class teachers. So if anybody's interested, uh, come and find uh, Heather, uh, Claude Ross, uh, Sam, me. Let us know. We would love to kind of put you into the rotation. And, and I'll, be, I'll be kind of going through a lot of the training next, uh, every Wednesday that's going to prepare us, hopefully, for the Sunday morning conversation. That's what I wanted to Yes. You're not just going to be... Yeah, there's going to be a training class every Wednesday prior to the Sunday, so you'll be a little bit better prepared. Yeah. Fall quarter. Yes. So let us know, please, and that would be great. Thank you so much for paying attention and for listening. Let's close in prayer, and we will be uh, dismissed. Thank you, Lord, for um, everything you've done for us. And, Thank you for this book, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us uh, to just read it this, this next week or so. Help us to, to listen to it, even if it's through audio. Just help us to engage with the word that you've given us. Help us not to take it for granted. And even though we may not understand and we may have a lot of questions, Lord, ease our anxiety, uh, but help us to be able to learn together in the Spirit and through great conversation. Lord, we are yours, and we are thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for listening.